Welcome to Bayesian Intervals and Bernoulli Trials. So we've been playing with the Bernoulli experiment because it's pretty much the easiest experiment and we can go all the way through the analysis on this, uh, all the way out to intervals and some hypothesis testing, relatively easy without having to get really, really complicated here. And uh, we're staying in sort of the conjugate world where things behave nicely. We'll talk about when they don't behave nicely later, but first we gotta figure out how we're getting through this. All right, right, we have um, Bernoulli random variables, that means there's zero ones. We're gonna have a prior distribution, which is gonna be beta, alpha, beta are its parameters. We're gonna get some data, which is the number of observations that we collect, and the sum of the xi, which is the number of successes, is going to be our data. Uh, our posterior distribution is this, and we'll be using this later. We have a mean and a variance. We talked about how to get probabilities out of the posterior distribution, just using p beta. Uh, we talked about how to get probabilities between two numbers, probability greater than two numbers using the uh, uh, one minus trick, the complement. And we also talked about how to get a quantile. And we actually got last time an interval using quantiles, and we'll do that again here uh, just to reinforce the idea. Okay, so there's doing Bayesian inference, there's a philosophy change, okay? So the frequentist approach, the parameter theta is fixed, okay? It's a fixed value in the population. It never changes, okay? The Bayesian approach is the parameter theta is random. It's a random variable that's governed by some probability distribution. And because of this, all inferences should be probabilistic in nature, okay? So being fixed versus random, I'm going to show you what that looks like here real quick. So uh, recall the frequentist confidence interval, the, the typical suggestion or the way to interpret it is, if you were to repeat the experiment lots and lots and lots of lots of times, the interval will capture the true value C percent of the time. This is your confidence level. So think about that. The interval is the thing that's moving, and here is a picture of that. So I've simulated 100 confidence intervals here, and all the ones in green are captured capture this purple line, which is the fixed true value in the population. I simulated it so I know it. So this purple line here is the true fixed value, and you can see the green are ones are the ones that actually captured it, and the ones that are red are the ones that missed it, okay? So that's how you have to think about the frequentist approach on this, because if you look at this, um, the horizontal line is fixed. It's not moving. So you can't talk about things so easily. Uh, the, if you notice, the interval is what is random, right? Those endpoints are changing. It's moving around, and it varies from experiment to experiment. Not that Bayesian intervals won't vary from experiment to experiment, because it does depend on the data. So what is the probability that our, pro our the confidence interval captured the true value? So I give you two numbers, and I say, did this work or not? And the answer is... It's either one if it did, and or zero if it didn't. And the problem is, is remember, we don't know P0. So we're never going to know whether or not we captured it. Um, and since P0 is not uh, random, we can't make probability statements about it from a frequentist approach. Um, so from a Bayesian approach, uh, P hat is going, or P is going to be random. And let's just play around here with a way of making an interval that sort of mimics the frequentist ways, right? If you look at the frequentist uh, or confidence intervals, you'll see P hat plus or minus Z star alpha over two square root of P hat one minus P hat over N. And then, you know, you get this sort of general formula of the point estimate plus or minus some table value times some standard error of the point estimate. And that thing usually has a square root associated with it somewhere. All right, and we know for the beta experiment, if, if we have a beta, alpha, beta prior, we have, here's our posterior mean, so that would be the point estimate, uh, and we have a pair, posterior variance, which could be our standard error right here if we take the square root of it. So we can create a formula here that resembles or mimics how a frequentist would work, right? They would take this plus or minus a table value. I'm just using Z because it's simple at the moment. And here is my uh, standard error with the square root. Or this is substituting for it. 
Okay. So let's look at an example and we'll see how this works. A cell phone merchant is interested in whether people are planning to buy a new cell phone or not within the next six months. Based on his experience, he guesses that about 12 out of 100 would be purchasing a new cell phone this year or in the next six months. So how can we turn this information of his guess into prior information? Because he has no other information other than his guess. Okay, well, this would correspond to uh, a beta. We could use the beta distribution with alpha equals 12 and beta equals 88 because you can think of this as alpha is the number of successes, beta is the number of failures. He mentioned 12 successes out of 100, which would mean there would be 88 failures. We'll talk more about getting these prior distributions later, but I'm just giving you a glimmer of it ahead of time. So our distribution prior to actually collecting any data is going to be beta 1288. Okay, so this is based off his prior information, his prior guess. Okay, so then he goes out and conducts a simple random sample of people around several markets where he's at, and he finds out that out of 387 people uh, that he asked, 28 said that they plan on uh, purchasing a new cell phone in the next six months. Okay, so here's what we have. We have our random variable is Bernoulli, right? If you think about it, are you going to buy it? Yes or no? That's it. He's, if they said yes, that is a clear intention to buy. If they say, I don't know, I would not claim that would be a clear intention to buy. All right, so this corresponds to N equals 387, and our sum of the XI are already given, okay? Because he said that he already had a, sort of added them up already. 28 of them said yes. So here's our formula. Here is the information that we have. Uh, so we have all the pieces, and then we can just start plugging this in uh, to our formula and see what happens. So here we go. So here's our data. Here's our formula. Start plugging in the numbers, 12 for alpha, uh, 88 for beta. Whenever we have the sum of the xi, we plug in a 28. Wherever we see an n, we plug a 387. Uh, and the table value, I'm just sticking to the 95% table value that most people use, which is 1.96. Uh, again, plug in all the numbers over here where they belong. Uh, calculate, 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 and calculate. And you'll end up with an approximate 95% confidence interval or credible. It's an actual credible interval for the population proportion of people who will buy the cell phone in the next six months is 0.0567 to 0.1075. Okay. Now, if you remember, his initial guess was 12%, and that's not in this interval, but that's not here nor there. The key thing is, is this is an approximate. And I, I'm going to highlight this because it assumes that approximate normality of the posterior distribution when we pick this z value we're using the normal distribution and anytime you see that you should be thinking that there's some assumption of normality here and we'll look to see how close things come out in a minute okay so we also have this information right well we could use quantiles instead so why not let's give it a go uh it's pretty easy remember from our first slide we have this uh, we know this formula. We know all the numbers there. Plug everything in, and we end up with a beta 40, 4, 4, 7, 447. Use R. Here's the code for R right here. Uh, notice that I'm going to get the lower 0 0.025. I'm actually going to grab the median in case I need a point estimate. And I'm going to grab the upper 0 0.975, all of these quantiles, from a beta 40, 4, 4, 7. Uh, do that. Here's what pops out out of R, and you can see I want this number and this number. My point estimate is about 0 0.08, uh, and we have a 95% cr uh, credible interval for the proportion of people who will buy a cell phone in the next six months is 0 0.0594 and 0 0.1081. Now, um, how close was this to the other one? Well, this is pretty close. If you look at these, they're not horridly different. They're, I mean, they are different, but they're not horridly different. Uh, they both are pretty close. And the, the question is, is we know that this is 95%. What is the probability of this interval uh, given if P were random? Well, if you plug this in, 
uh, to R using the P beta and then subtract using the formula at the beginning, you'll get 0 0.9599. So it's about a 96% probability that P would be in this interval. We know that it is exactly 95% being in this interval. All right, there's one other approach to this, which is called the highest probability density region approach to getting intervals. But we're going to skip over that at the moment. We'll come back to it later. Um, I worry that we'll get too complicated and people will get lost. But using the quantiles is the most frequently used approach to this. But I'm showing you both approaches because you see people do all kinds of stuff and you might as well know that they exist so that when you see them you're not confused on what they're doing uh you may be confused on why they're doing it but at least you'll know what they're doing all right so we're going to talk about hypothesis tests in the next video see you there